Great. Um, welcome to the Hong Kong Green Finance Association's Biodiversity Training Series. My name is Jenny Lee, the Deputy Secretary General of HKGFA. This is the first of a five-module biodiversity webinar series co-organized by the HKGFA Banking Net Zero Commitments and HKGFA's TNFD Biodiversity Workstream that aims to provide industry professionals with the latest global and regional market developments, how to navigate the evolving standards and principles with practical considerations for integration into business operations and sustainable finance product structuring. Today, we have a panel of distinguished industry experts, and I'm delighted to extend a warm welcome to Mr. Gratien Devat, Green and Sustainable Finance Expert at Natixis, Green Sustainable Hub Center of Expertise and Innovation, Ms. Joanne Lee, Responsible Investment Specialist at First Center Investors, and Mr. Patrick Ho, Sustainable Development, Swire Properties um, Limited, Task Force Member of TNFD and the HKGFA Co-Chair for the TNFD Biodiversity Workstream. A few words on housekeeping before we start the session. Before we kick off, uh, we will have time um, for questions after the panel discussion. Please do write your questions in the Q&A uh, box. If you do require attendance to claim CPT hours, please also complete the survey at the end of this webinar. So without much further ado, I will now pass the floor to Gratien. Thank you. So Gratien, over to you. Excuse me. Thank you very much, um, Jenny, uh, for the introduction. I'm very glad to be here among uh, sustainability leaders from uh, Hong Kong. Um, so this session is the first uh, session of a series of introductory uh, um, um, calls for uh, biodiversity and nature into uh, finance. Um, this session will um, um, revolve around the notions of biodiversity, its main concepts, uh, the global and regional state of nature uh, internationally and in APAC, uh, and the momentum of nature integration in finance and globally in the economy. Um, so first, uh, uh, we'll uh, set uh, the, the discussion and set the notions uh, around the discussions uh, uh, defining nature, biodiversity and its main concepts. Uh, and we'll uh, have a look at the global state of biodiversity and uh, uh, how um, different scenarios are being envisioned by economic actors to project uh, the state of nature in the future. Then we'll uh, deep dive into APAC, uh, state of biodiversity. So um, uh, what is the state of of uh, Asia's uh, biomes uh, and uh, how, we, how it impacts uh, its economy. Um, and uh, then we'll have a, an overlook of the, the global and regional momentum towards biodiversity and nature integration in finance. Then uh, at the end, we'll have a fireside fireside chat and a Q&A session uh, for which you can uh, uh, provide us a question uh, in the Q&A uh, module of, the, of Doom. Um, so first, we'll, uh, we'll have a look uh, uh, at the definition of uh, biodiversity and nature's uh, sectors driving biodiversity loss, the relationship between pressure and impact, uh, and uh, we'll uh, take some time on ecosystem services and the dependencies of our businesses uh, on these ecosystem services. Um, the macro criticality of nature loss is uh, uh, about determining how it is impacting the economy globally uh, and why it should be a, a, a matter uh, taken care of. Um, so first, uh, let's me deep dive into um, the notions of biodiversity and nature. Um, so biodiversity is derived from biological diversity and refers to the, vari the variety of living species that are available on Earth. It encompasses plants, animals, bacteria and fungi and all of their interactions together. Nature, on the other hand, regroups all non-human living entities and their interaction with other living or non-living physical entities and processes. And these definitions recognize uh, the interactions uh, that bind humans to nature and its subcomponents, so species, soils, rivers, nutrients, uh, and else. And in this context and in the context of human activities having an impact on nature, biological diversity, so biodiversity, is a sensor of the state of nature globally. Uh, 
um, in all its dimensions, whether um, ecosystems are being rich, uh, their intactness and the capacity they have to renew themselves and provide ecosystem services, notions we'll define right after. Um, and together, these notions give a sense of how human interactions both impact and depend on the environment. So indeed, nature supports human needs. Uh, it provides basic needs, food, oxygen, fresh water, recycling of nutrients, but also natural materials like food fibers and uh, timber, for example, uh, bioenergy, waste decomposition, soil fertility are all services that are provided by nature. Um, it has also a regulatory role uh, in the face of natural disasters, example, uh, flood protection from mangroves um, and uh, against epidemics. Um, they provide a, a, a sort of barrier in between the, the human world and the, the wilder world, creating a, um, an interface in which um, viruses cannot go. Um, and also it helps with regulating climate. Um, and it has also a utilitarian function. Uh, it provides crucial services such as pollination on which we rely to produce food, for example. So here you can see all the intricacies of our uh, uh, economies and human needs with nature. Then us as a living species uh, have been impacting uh, nature. Um, and the statistics here are quite gloomy, yet uh, needed to understand the problem. Um, since the 1970s, the wild uh, population of uh, vertebrates have, has been declining by 69%. That's uh, an example, but if you, you go in absolute terms, one million uh, species now are threatened with extinction, um, which were not before. 85% uh, of the world's wetland have disappears, disappeared, and all of these um, statistics uh, are the result of uh, human uh, activities. And so if we are impacting the ecosystems we depend upon, um, at some point there will be an issue and this is how it is what is being assessed by the IP, ipbes the equivalent of the ipcc for biodiversity uh, through its reports and on the right side you can see here uh, how the ecosystem services have been evolving over time uh, the last 50 years so for example you can see that um, the, the 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 fresh water uh, provisioning um, in the entire world has been uh, decreasing uh, through human-made impacts um, in the last 50 years. You can also see that materials and uh, and uh, other uh, assistance from nature, such as timber provisioning, has been first decreasing and is now re-increasing thanks to uh, sustainable management uh, in forestry. Um, so you can see that our uh, impacts on nature um, is very vi variable. Um, and it is not like climate change where we have a linear relationship between our CO2 emissions and the increase in temperatures. Here, human activities have been impacting vari variably, so differently uh, in time and regionally uh, as well, because in uh, Asia, in Europe, in the Americas, the rhythm and pace at which ecosystem services have been evolving has varied a lot. Um, and so um, there are many differences to, to consider when analyzing, for example, for a business on which ecosystem services it depends and in which geographies. Uh, and biodiversity coming from this is a very complex issue, but complexity uh, must not stifle action. Indeed, as I just said, climate, you know, on the other hand, has quite a, a, a simpler um, uh, understanding and, is, and can be managed better because CO2 emissions are a unique indicator that is fungible and um, shows a very simple linear relationship with the increase in temperature. Yet, when it comes to biodiversity and nature, the relations uh, between human activities and nature loss are very complicated. 
the IPBUS tried to simplify this relation uh, by popularizing the notion of pressure. Uh, pressures are under the number of five uh, and they uh, explain for the loss of biodiversity. So the first pressure would be the land and sea use change that uh, is defined by the destruction of ecosystem through draining of wetlands, deforestation or artificialization, or also the fragmentation of ecosystem by creating obstacles to species movement. So it could be roads, for example, the disturbance of ecosystem through noise or light pollution that disturbs uh, species. We can think of uh, cities uh, light pollution or even um, noise pollution from airports. Um, then there is um, the direct exploitation factor, which uh, is the second most important uh, uh, pressure on biodiversity, uh, which um, is explained by the removal uh, of, uh, of, um, of timber, for example, uh, fish uh, beyond their renewal capacity, um, beyond what nature is, is capable to uh, reproduce over time. Um, then there is a third uh, pressure on biodiversity, which is pollution, it can be air or water pollution through the release of toxic substances in different, uh, in different businesses. Um, then there is climate change that you all know, uh, provoking a rise in temperature and sea level and increasing the, the, the number of extreme weather events, maybe wildfires destroying ecosystems. Uh, then there is invasive species, um, species that are non-native to an ecosystem and will disturb an ecosystem until they, they destroy the balance that uh, previously existed uh, in an ecosystem. And here, these are the five uh, direct drivers of, of biodiversity loss, and they are um, um, ranked. Um, they are ranked for their importance uh, in uh, driving biodiversity loss. But that importance is different from a region to another. So here you have a picture of what are the, the, the pressures at a world level. But in Asia, for example, invasive alien species is a more impactant factor of uh, biodiversity loss than climate change. So it can vary also among regions. That's what explains also the complexity of the matter. Yet, there is an invariant uh, worldwide. And on the, the, the next slide, you can see that um, actually the sectors and industries driving biodiversity loss are food and beverage first, because they, they use a, um, a huge amount of land to produce the feedstock uh, and the, the, the grains and all we use in our uh, food and beverage industry. Uh, then comes infrastructure and mobility uh, with what I told you earlier, land use change also provoked by um, the establishment of roads uh, in, in uh, sensitive ecosystems, etc. Then there's the energy system through air pollution, through um, water consumption, then comes fashion and other sectors uh, that have at different stages of their value chains, pressures on the environment, whether it's pollution, whether it's climate change, whether it's land use change. Um, and um, these are sort of driving biodiversity loss worldwide. But you will agree with me that um, humanity needs food uh, in order to, uh, to, to survive and um, that we cannot just stop producing food, but we uh, certainly need to consider how we do it in order to reverse uh, biodiversity loss and stop biodiversity loss. Um, in the next slide, we'll go into what are uh, the related risks for industries, because um, we understand the problem now. The, the statistics show us that biodiversity is declining worldwide, uh, that we rely on ecosystem services, but what does it entail for, for businesses? Biodiversity is, can be more of a risk uh, than opportunity, um, than opportunity uh, theme uh, for now. Um, so we have seen in numerous industries, I'm thinking of mining, I'm thinking of energy, that uh, some risks were, um, were encountered by, uh, by industries, uh, whether they are regulatory, liability, 
with um, with trials uh, in courts for I don't know uh, non-respect of environmental laws in certain countries, um, regulatory risk with uh, recent evolutions over uh, over uh, nature integration in uh, in reporting, for example, uh, whether it's in Europe or or elsewhere. Um, ecological risks on operation as well. If you depend on ecosystem service that uh, will no longer function, uh, your uh, production process will be uh, hampered. Uh, market risk as well, uh, with um, consumers starting to consider uh, nature into their uh, choices. Reputational risks uh, facing, uh, for example, deforestation. Some company might be boycotted because of, uh, of uh, its deforestation uh, uh, deeds. Uh, and then financial risks. If uh, you rely on ecosystem services that stop functioning, that may impact uh, your um, profitability and therefore uh, your finances. Um, so that is a, dis a qualitative description of, uh, of the channels of uh, risks that could impact businesses. And on, the, on this slide, you can actually see that some institutions in, uh, in the world have been trying to uh, define risk analysis uh, on, uh, on nature. And indeed, um, they consider that pricing nature-related risk is instrumental for financial institutions uh, to align with the goal of the global biodiversity framework that was designed at the COP15 in uh, Kunming Montreal, COP15. Um, and indeed, uh, when assessing the risks related to water, um, they realized that it was quite dominant in, uh, in many industries, water is needed to process uh, materials um, and it showed that seven to nine percent of global GDP was um, quite uh, uh, dependent on water services, uh, and therefore it creates a risk uh, with increased uh, water stress, with uh, the depletion of certain ecosystems. Um, it creates a risk uh, in, in, uh, in uh, production processes. And uh, it can be the same in agriculture. The loss of pollination and, uh, and uh, fertility in some land creates a financial risk uh, that is uh, quite important in the long term. These, um, these direct impacts could be amplified by cascading feedbacks. Um, so that would mean the loss uh, of pollinators uh, could create uh, food scarcity in some, at some point, and therefore, um, more uh, agriculture extension in, uh, in other regional areas, uh, intensification and biodiversity loss uh, in the end as well, or a multiplication of factors that would impact all the more the financial system. So these institutions, namely the Network for Greening the Financial System, which is a, a group of central banks working together in integrating both climate and nature in, a, in a risk analysis in financial institutions, and the European Central Banks have been designing scenarios in order to understand how uh, biodiversity could evolve over time and to stress, stress test their balance sheet um, according to these scenarios. Um, and these scenarios rely on uh, uh, more, or less, more or less complex models uh, and data that is already available to all of us um, through either public databases or private ones um, and try to match both local uh, ecosystem data and uh, more uh, entity level, business level uh, data in order to stress test uh, economic activities regarding ecosystem services. So that's how uh, these institutions are first trying to account for nature-related risks. Uh, and they show that it is critical. Um, so now let's deep dive into, uh, into uh, Asia and, uh, and the Pacific state of uh, biodiversity. Uh, and the IPBES is quite, uh, is quite clear on that end. Um, the Asia-Pacific region is, uh, is very rich in terms of biodiversity. It's home to 70% of the world's biodiversity um, and 60% um, and of the world's population. Uh, it has, a, it has um, 
a lot of pressure on biodiversity, of course, uh, through invasive species pollution. You all know um, uh, the, the overfishing issues, the coral bleaching issues, the deforestation issues uh, in, the, in the region. Uh, on the next slide, um, we, we can see that um, humanity and in Asia as well uh, is depending on various ecosystem services. It is currently degrading. Uh, forest cover uh, has been lost uh, in the in the last 15 year, 50 years, 50% uh, of it. 60% of grassland is degraded due to, due to overgrazing, and eight of the 10 most polluted uh, rivers uh, with uh, uh, are in Asia. Um, and some assessments show that 63% uh, of uh, APAX GDP can be at risk related to nutter. Uh, to water to uh, can be at risk related to uh, for example overfishing um, assessment shows that fish stock could collapse in 30 years water increasing scarcity threatens agriculture industries and sanitation and as well pollination with a, a decline in pollinators um, sorry for the the, the small acceleration uh, the time is going uh, quite fast um, so global and uh, regional momentum now so we can see one thing that's um, quite important. Uh, actually, nature integration is quite following the steps of climate. Uh, we're thinking about uh, Paris, Paris uh, COP uh, uh, 21 in 2015, uh, and now the, the COP 15 in coming world that have been both um, uh, uh, providing tremendous uh, advance in establishing uh, targets. Um, and indeed, uh, the COP15 Montreal uh, target, halt and reverse biodiversity loss by 2050, has been driving uh, the international community and even businesses in understanding how nature should be integrating their business and providing a clear trajectory on which to align uh, as for the 1.5 degrees Celsius designed uh, in, the, in the Paris Agreement. Also, among other uh, targets were to restore 30% of degraded ecosystems and conserve and manage 30% uh, areas. Um, many other targets uh, related to plastics, related to um, uh, nature-related reporting, uh, the, the pesticides use, highly hazardous chemicals, or other uh, targets have been designed and quite instrumental for businesses, businesses actually, uh, in order to um, advance on uh, preserving nature altogether. Um, on, the, on the next slide, you can see that 2023 has been packed with uh, a set of standards that, are, that have appeared related to nature integration. Um, so it feels like uh, 2023 has been the year to for setting standard and 2024 will be the year of applying these standards and operationalizing at a scale all of these standards to better integrate nature. For example, if you see on the next slide, a set of indicators have been designed uh, by the TNFD um, um, for which uh, industries can report on. Um, scope one and two and three emissions is something we already know, but land, freshwater, ocean use change is something that uh, is quite new in, a, in, a, in a ESG reporting, let's say. Um, pollution removal as well, resource use uh, and other nature-related risks are now a key in, a, in a sustainability reportings, and uh, this standard is the equivalent of the TCFD, uh, which was designed in 2050, uh, 2015 as well. Um, and uh, we can see that it integration might follow the same path and accelerate the movement towards better nature uh, integration and understanding in, uh, in businesses. Now, um, in APAC, um, we uh, have seen uh, many countries um, for COP15 uh, setting new targets related to conservation and restoration of, uh, of uh, nature. Um, but what is uh, all the more striking is how it relates to businesses. Um, on the sidelines of uh, these commitments, they also uh, set a, a certain number of taxonomies that we can see uh, on the next slide that um, integrate nature uh, per se. So uh, China, uh, Malaysia, uh, Hong Kong is setting a, a taxonomy now, uh, Singapore, Australia, um, and uh, other countries have been setting uh, taxonomies that more or less address nature and un 
on the next slide, we can see that uh, um, the ASEAN taxonomy is actually tackling nature uh, in, its, uh, in its taxonomy with a certain uh, uh, number of uh, goals that should be met by uh, taxonomy aligned uh, assets. Uh, a taxonomy is a set of uh, activities that are uh, contributing to uh, preserving nature or um, uh, mitigating climate change or adapting uh, to climate change. They are, they are said to be the list of economic activities that are sustainable. Um, and uh, Asia is, uh, is quite prolific in providing uh, taxonomies and innovating in that, uh, in that matter. So here it is for the, the, the global stock take of, uh, of biodiversity and nature uh, globally and in APAC. I'm uh, very pleased to have been able to present uh, that to you. Uh, on our end, um, we've been uh, designing a survey um, that uh, you can find in the slides later that will be sent uh, to you. So please feel free to answer this survey. It's uh, directed towards investors, but you can still uh, you can still enter. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. And I'm uh, happy now to uh, go through the panel discussion uh, with uh, our uh, two great panelists, uh, sustainability leaders from uh, Hong Kong that both have uh, more than 10 years of experience in, uh, in the sustainability area and a point in common, they have both been they have both been working at uh, the World Wildlife Foundation um, uh, in their past uh, uh, years. Uh, now I will uh, start by welcoming uh, Joanne Lee, uh, we, who is um, a sustainable finance expert at uh, First Sentier Investors, uh, an asset manager. You have more than 14 years uh, of experience uh, in the field now. Um, you've been working as a responsible investment specialist and you are leading First Sentier Investors uh, on nature and biodiversity. And you previously held uh, positions as WWF as a sustainable uh, finance specialist driving research on a net zero portfolio alignment, natural capital, and uh, green financial solutions. Um, thank you for joining, Joanne. Um, Patrick, uh, Ho, you, you are uh, head of sustainable development at Swire Properties, uh, HK property uh, developer, owner, and operator. You have been working on nature integration uh, in Swire Properties, notably through the implementation of uh, nature-based solutions in the group's activities and through nature-related reporting. And you are one of the 40 members of uh, the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosure. So thank you very much to both of you for joining us uh, on this uh, fireside chat. Um, and um, I will start by asking uh, a few questions to, to, to Patrick, uh, and then we will go uh, with, uh, with Joanne for an asset manager, manager's perspective on uh, nature integration. So uh, Patrick, thank you very much. Uh, you have been uh, involved in uh, TNFD as one of the 40 members in the Global Task Force and uh, Swire Properties is also one of the few pioneering companies in HK to pilot the, uh, the TNFD uh, beta uh, framework. Um, can you share with us uh, why Swire Properties decided to pilot uh, the TNFD? Okay. Thank you, Platian, for your for your question. I'm very happy to be able to join the panel today with uh, distinguished speakers and see a lot of uh, friends on online joining today. So I guess on nature, I guess the business case for why a real estate developer should care about nature is very clear. For example, through land con conversion, exploitation of natural resources, as Platian Pine Point has you know very clearly pointed out, and Pollution and contribution to climate change to build environment is exactly a very significant cause of nature, nature loss. Also, the built environment is heavily dependent on nature, you know, and it's the largest global consumer of raw materials. In, in for example, in 2019, the urban areas were dis responsible for the extraction of 60 million tons of renewable and non-renewable -renew raw materials. For example, plants, fossil fuels, ores, and other construction materials, of which around 40% was stone, sand, gravel, you know, and 25% were virgin timber. And also materials like sand, the foundation of modern civilization is, is very essential as an aggregate for concrete and glass production. And it's being mined at a, you know, very quick rate 
than it's being naturally replenished. And subsequently, there's a looming resource crisis and as a demand for, for sand and other materials, it only increase as the global population grows, which closes to 10 billion people expected to inhabit you know, the planet by 2050. So, so that's a very clear business case for us to get informed and you know, very actively working on it. So for Thrive Properties, nature and biodiversity has been our core focus on our sustainable development strategy C2030. And we have been working very hard to integrate nature um, into our developments from, for example, from introducing um, nature inclusive designs to nature-based solutions and promoting circularity in our building construction operations. We have been um, taking uh, steps to ensure a, a projects have a better and positive impact on nature and biodiversity. It's only not, you know, only help us to, you know, manage this emerging risk, but also give us a competitive advantage as biophilic buildings. Design is now gaining a lot more momentum and a performance to how we address these nature-related risks and opportunities are increasingly assessed uh, by investors like you and also from our commercial tenants. And the pandemic in particular has also highlighted the importance of well-being and demand for open green spaces and good air quality. Our, our tenants start to you know, recognize a lot more about the importance of um, nature and biodiversity and building features like green roofs, uh, good, better plant landscaping and urban farms are, are, are highly visible and very desirable by many of them. And this would potentially hopefully build property value over time. So for Swap Properties myself, it's very honored to be um, a TNFD member. And with this privilege, um, we have been able to become an early adopter also actively testing and piloting the um, TNFD framework at, at an early stage. And this allows us to provide direct feedback to TNFD and, and its formulation and contribute learnings and insights to help the framework evolve. Now, the final recommendation V1 is, uh, has been already launched and it will start to change uh, last year in September. So, um, so it's already up there. A lot of companies are you know, uh, taking up of it and learning process. So from, from, from my point of view, in terms of learning from, from the TNFD pilot, I think the first key um, thing recommendation you know, by TNFD is, to, is the assessment process. Uh, no matter where you disclose, you, you have to do a sort of assessment you know, of your recent opportunities. And they re recommend the LEAP process, locate, evaluate, assess, prepare assessment approach, and actually to help us you know, to evaluate the dependencies and impact on nature. So for, for Swire Properties, we are conducting a portfolio screening for Global Portfolio Hong Kong, China and USA, Southeast Asia, for example, to identify priority locations that may give us have that may have higher dependency on nature and where we can make tangible improvement to biodiversity. Our experience in, uh, I think, in the past reporting against CCFD framework uh, has been prepared well for TNFD as well. Uh, as you as you understand, the governance structure we established for managing climate related issues can be well adapted to address uh, nature related concerns. And furthermore, for you know, sort of ongoing sustainability reporting, data collection, some core data metrics such as water usage, waste generation, um, biodiversity data, consumption, volume of some high impact commodities, and greenhouse gases, these are already uh, there. And by ut utilizing these data, we have improved our understanding about connections in nature, as well as helping us to identify material dependencies and, and impacts. But of course, that's, that's not enough. It's not enough. Additionally, we have leverage. We have to leverage um, some uh, data tools to help us to collect and analyze some spatial and scientific data to help us under, understand nature interface per site because you know, nature impacts is very local specific, very different from climate and carbon. And for example, we have to go into types of data, for example, you know, what are our interface with critical habitats, protected areas, water stress, threatened species within the site and, you know, and, and adjacent to the site and species diversity and richness and biodiversity intactness of the site itself. So this process has, has actually fa facilitates us to identify um, what, where are the priority locations for further evaluation actions. And the TNFD pilot has also provided us with uh, some valuable insights, particularly regarding the importance of gathering um, nature rate related data and translating it into practical and um, actionable insights. For example, when we initiate our um, Taiku Place Redevelopment Project, at uh, Corrie Bay here in Hong Kong, we 
conduct a very comprehensive urban biodiversity study in co collaboration with Dr. Billy Howe from the University of Hong Kong. And this study established the baseline for biodiversity, urban biodiversity in the area and proposed measure to achieve biodiversity net gain over time. And the study finding informed our sort of infrastructure planning on, on blue-green infrastructure planning, resulting in a design that incorporates large size, um, you know, native woodland species, that are, you know, late native species we find in Hong Kong. And that is equivalent to around 70,000 uh, square feet of additional um, urban greenery. And to achieve a healthy and resilient urban forest, we have also made reference to the 10, 20, 30 basic rules of plant diversity as a start. Uh, for example, no more than 10% of any one species, 20% of any one genus, and 30% of one family to enhance diversity. What we plan to achieve is approximately 35% uh, of the whole Taiku place will be um, covered by um, the green areas, featuring a sort of continuous tall tree canopy that acts as a green corridor and facilitating movement of birds and butterflies, for example, some insects between um, the Taiku Place the green area within it, and also adjacent to Taiku Place, there are country parks in, in Kauri Bay, and also public parks by the government nearby. And there are, you can find urban diversity of there. So how we connect these uh, green areas together is also another design consideration. And this investment in green space also help raise our climate adaptation ability as the green space help mitigate the intensity of you know, uh, pluvial flooding by slowing and storing water um, during intense rain events, and also improve the district level sort of microclimate by reducing the heat island effect. And this district level air quality um, will, will also be improved. So benefiting the health and well-being of the local community. And, and this is a case that exemplifies how nature positive buildings can create value for, for the business itself, for our tenants, for people, and also for the environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. V very interesting. Um, so that case showed how you, you integrated uh, nature into uh, your day-to-day -day, uh, activities and business models. Can you tell us about um, how it changed actually your day-to-day -day activities to consider nature uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a your own business? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, maybe I could share a few um, practical examples, actions where mm -hmm. we've taken in our day-to-day -day business activity to, to support that you know, vision, you know, advancement towards a nature positive environment. I think that first of all, you know, how we, you know, select sites. And I, can, I guess an important principle is to avoid further natural habitat conversion and or de degradation, as you mentioned in your slide. Uh, how we site new buildings and infrastructure responsibly by locating them in previously impacted areas, you know, in, instead of you know uh, any you know sort of biodiversity rich area or green area, and to prevent further loss of natural uh, habitat. In all cases, avoid locations in protected areas and internationally recognized areas, and ensure no critical habitats are, are impacted. And consider impact on nature uh, is key when you know start the design process. For example, you, how you use space efficiently uh, sort of to import, uh, minimize impacts you have on the land and water. And where um, modifying natural habitat or affecting wildlife is unavoidable, you have to commit you know, sort of, sort of strategies aimed to achieve measurable positive outcome for biodiversity. So the con is the concept of achieving biodiversity net gain. So we have in place that of biodiversity guidelines policy for portfolio development and management, which um, aim to define the importance of biodiversity and covers uh, appropriate biodiversity management and enhancement measures during the um, entire project life cycle. And it also is, has uh, provided very good recommendations for our project teams, for example, on topics such as conducting ecological surveys, designed for good quality uh, woodland patches, native plant species recommendation, microhabitat micro uh, consideration, and uh, sustainable use of natural resource, uh, et cetera. And secondly, uh, it's key that you know, climate has to be, play a very important part here, how we address climate change and nature simultane simultaneously in any project, because they are so much interlinked. Uh, in highly urbanized area here in Hong Kong, the urban heat line effect is a typical phenomenon we find here. Buildings, roads, and pavement absorb solar heat, leading to higher temperatures in an urban area. We can address this by investing more in, in urban greenery projects. More trees on the, on the streets and nature adaptive buildings, how we feature green roofs and green walls. I guess these are some of the measures we can consider and that's uh, how the Taiku place with development projects and incorporate, incorporate such considerations when it's designed. So it helps mitigate 
um, the heat island effect. And moving beyond direct operations, I guess supply chain is another very key area. Um, across the wider industry, I guess there's currently still generally limited understanding of how buildings impact nature remotely from the site, um, especially when you go down to the value chain. So upstream value chain, for example, material extraction, mining, and manufacturing impacts on nature are, um, as you borrow the term from carbon, uh, embodied within, within the fabric of the buildings and sometimes more significant than the on-site direct impacts on nature uh, resulting from site clearance and construction building. So uh, there's a study out there indicates that, um, you know, 95% of the construction sector's impact on nature is actually associated with upstream supply chain activity. Um, so these embodied impacts of nature are not always fully considered during building design. And there are currently um, no, you know, obvious frameworks that help us to measure embodied nature impacts bar, partly due to significant absence of data and lack of transparencies in, in, in value chain. So I hopefully TNFD would have actually try to address that. And, uh, but uh, even, you know, we have problem, is that not a reason for excuse for, you know, doing nothing. So I guess um, as a as developer for ourselves and designers are very influential in the in the choice of building materials that we we can select. But so by understanding a high biodiversity impact commodity such as um, concrete, steel, sand, timber, and through better planning, uh, companies in, in, in our industry can actually gradually shift to more sustainable sourcing of certified commodities. Uh, for example, 100% uh, of development in Hong Kong have been using sustainable timber sourced from FSC standard or other equivalent standard. And uh, there are a lot more to do. And related to that, developers can also drive transformative change by adopting um, circular um, material practices. So how you carefully select construction materials and maximize their reuse. Uh, I think what's best practice sample is coming from uh, the, uh, the recent, you know, growing uh, adoption of low carbon concrete, you know, and these are recycled materials consisting of around 25% of uh, uh, pulverish fly ash. This is a byproduct of waste material from coal burning, and that's incorporated into the concrete mix so that you, uh, you can drastically reduce the virgin you know, cement that you need to procure and from the mining activities down the value chain. So, and for our latest uh, developed building to tackle in Corey Bay, 100% of the concrete use has been uh, adopting that, you know, low carbon concrete, PFA concrete. And that uh, also comes with a much lower embodied carbon. And it's very important for us to meet our science-based target addressing uh, and one of the important scope free emissions from 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 the um, upfront and body carbon. And the ultimate aim is to achieve a better circularity. If you measure a building circularity, how you measure input output, you know, across the whole material value chains, I guess this is also the direction that, you know, we should think more about. And, and lastly, you know, how we consider and apply nature based solutions, you know, combining uh, as you mentioned, coastal defense structures with nature inclusive design uh, will provide opportunities for nature enhancement and flood control, and also a better protection uh, potential to adapt better um, to future um, climate scenarios. That's just, uh, some of the examples that I want to share. Oh, that's a that's a very holistic approach from the the inception of uh, real estate projects, uh, designing the the supply chain, value chain integration, and nature integration in that. The, the the overall nature based solutions integration it's a uh, it's quite impressive thank you very much uh, patrick i will now turn to uh, to joanne um we who is a, a, an investor actually uh, might be interested by your uh, Swire properties activities and how it integrates nature uh, in its activities and um uh, i wanted to to ask you uh, joanne how did the uh, First Sentier uh, started its uh, started its journey on integrating uh, nature in uh, uh, first its due diligence processes. Yeah, thank you very much, Gratian. It was really great to hear from Patrick because all the examples that he's giving are so tangible and practical. So, from investors' point of view, we we usually deal with data. We we talk to companies, uh, but it's it's not as tangible and, and concrete as uh, some of the the actual work that, that he's been doing. So it's really nice to hear uh, from him. So at First Center Investors, uh, we have chosen uh, biodiversity as one of the key priority areas for our overarching uh, responsible investment uh, focus areas. So biodiversity, nature and biodiversity is one, climate change, 
human, human rights and modern slavery and diversity and inclusion. These are the four kind of key focus areas. And because of that, we've been working on, on many different fronts. We focus on engagement, uh, especially around microplastic uh, pollution issues. We've been working on research through our, our um, research body that's called Sustainable Investment um, Investment Institute that's really set up by FSI and our parent uh, MUFG. And uh, because of this, we 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 have been working on on different issues all these throughout all these uh, priority areas on how we can support our investment teams better understand these issues and better uh, able to um, engage with these companies with the right kind of framework and the preparation for it. So we call this a toolkit. So as I mentioned, throughout these all uh, focus areas, we have a climate change toolkit, human rights toolkit, modern slavery toolkit. And finally, uh, after I joined the, the firm, um, because this is an important area, we uh, got together with investment teams and we decided to um, develop a, a nature and biodiversity toolkit. So FSI, we are a very decentralized organization. We have uh, about 14 different investment teams. So some of the investment teams uh, who are interested in this topic because of their exposure, or because of their understanding of the, the importance of the issues or their climate client demands, they came together, we sat down and we uh, formed a, a body working group, a nature and biodiversity working group. And throughout, I think over a time of uh, um, a period of one year, we kept discussing, learning all these issues, setting the basics. And we basically developed a toolkit last year in May, which consisted of like key things like, what is it? You know, why is it important? And what are the key steps for due diligence and engagement uh, to uh, work on this topic? So it's a short document and we established that. And the feedback that we've got from our peers and also internally was that, hey, this is a, it's a very practical piece and it's a guide that we can actually share with our peers. So instead of us keeping it all to ourselves, if we share with other investors and other financial institutions and they the same, you know, um, asking things to ESG data providers or to companies, we can maybe increase our input altogether. So why don't we share this? So on that basis, we actually decided to publish this. Um, so now the published version, we call it uh, Investors Can Assess Nature Now Guide. So all of the front letters, we call it the I Can Guide. Um, so that we published the, uh, the guide in, in September. So this was kind of the journey that we've been kind of doing step by step. And I kind of went into detail about this because a lot of uh, other investors that I spoke with, they're actually not only interested in the content that we publish, but they're also interested in our journey of how we got to where we are, because you need to start from somewhere. And often you need to start from having a team, having expertise and understanding first. So it took us maybe three years to really get to where we are, but now we are there. And after the the guide and the toolkit, I think our, our investment teams, um, based on their, their knowledge, um, they're starting to apply the, the framework there and kind of take it all the way uh, towards uh, engaging with companies. Yeah. Well, very, very interesting and impressive. Can you tell us a bit more um, about the principles that are in the in the ICANN guide? What's guiding uh, investors? Yeah, so I yeah I wanted to uh, explain a little bit about what 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 it is and what you know what we're trying to do there. So it's a step by step guide. It's it's supposed to be a very practical guide because it started as a toolkit for our investment teams, and it means to uh, aims to help investors uh, assessing nature related issues in portfolio companies. Of course, it can be applied at other companies where bank uh, banks may be looking into uh, their loan portfolios, but primarily because we're an asset manager, we had that uh, our role in mind in terms of assessing and engaging with portfolio investee companies, and because of that. Uh, when we showcase our approaches, we are targeting listed equities and corporate bond issuers mainly. Um, and also, as you know, as you mentioned, uh, there are so many topics within nature. So we understood that we can't cover everything right now and we have to start somewhere. So we decided to uh, focus first on freshwater and deforestation. It's because they are so important in terms of climate change. Also, uh, we have uh, exposure to these sectors that are really impacting or dependent on these issues. And also because uh, the relative practicality and availability of the tools and resources out there for us to be able to understand uh, uh, issues related to these topics. 
So like uh, topics like ocean or uh, pollution, these are really important issues too, but relatively there's much less data that's available out there, so it, which is making it difficult for us to, to work on this topic. So this these are the kind of the scope of the, the guide. And basically it, it, it maps the due diligence framework, as I mentioned, along with just like any other toolkits that we have internally at First Century Investors. Um, it's a due diligence framework for appraising, assessing, and engaging on uh, kind of with companies on, on kind of three kind of steps. So first is about identification of vector exposure. So you have to have to understand, just like what Patrick mentioned and what Gretchen mentioned, it's really important to understand key material sectors that you are exposed to or that you, you want to understand better. And there are different ways to, to go about it. And based on that, and you can collect other kind of data, you know, it could be a company's a headquarter location data, it could be company's policy data. Uh, if you have access to location data, really, really great, although it's 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 not always available. So the collecting all this nature related data, I think that including the sector uh, heat map or uh, sector materiality exercise, I think that's kind of the first step. Once you have the, all the data and, and have mapped some of the material sectors, it's easier for, for I mean, investors can prioritize and assess companies. Um, so prioritize, I mean, is what oftentimes what we, what we hear from investors is that, hey, uh, there's so many um, companies that we have to look into and they all kind of moderately, mildly, all depend on nature. They're all important. So where do I begin? Which are the important companies to, to start with? So this is why we kind of go with the kind of collecting the data and use that data to prioritize which companies to delve further. So after that, it after that you have much like a smaller set of companies to zoom in. And then the toolkit offers a set of framework, due diligence framework, and also engagement framework for assessment, assessment, further assessment. Because without having these frameworks in mind, it's difficult for investors to know what to ask of companies. For example, if we know like, okay, for Swire, for example, you know, urban greenery is important, uh, embodied carbon, embodied materials are important. If we have this knowledge, it's easier for us to start the conversation, ask the right questions. But without that framework and understanding of the, the key issues, it's difficult. So it's setting up that kind of a, I would like to call it like a menu for investors to, to understand uh, these selected companies. And after that, we will go into the engagement um, step, but it's it's very also important for, for us to understand what kind of questions to ask in a meaningful way so that we can uh, approach it in a holistic way. So the toolkit, the guide also offers this kind of uh, engagement framework, both on uh, freshwater and deforestation issues to ask and engage with, with these companies. So what, what I think is in order for any other asset managers or investors to do this, um, first, I think you need basic understanding of concepts. So, so for me, I went in and I talked to our portfolio managers and analysts. They did not just become like, oh, yeah, I know about all these pressures and I can work on this. It takes time. So I think that's what's needed, One number one. And second is, as I mentioned earlier, it's really uh, important to have access to this data. So like, Having great like uh, reports and all, all this kind of disclosure coming from companies like Swire, it's really helpful for us because we get more, more data. Sometimes we get this uh, nature-related data from directly from companies, from company reports, sometimes from news, uh, but also a lot of times it's uh, from ESG data providers. This is why also it's important for us to work with ESG data providers as well as uh, directly with companies because Everyone, anytime you talk about nature, they will always talk about the problems and challenges with nature-related data, the quality and the quantity of it. So um, one, once you get have that, like the basic understanding and some accessibility to, to data, I think you're going to be in good place to kind of start building on this and maybe apply the, the, the principles in the, in the toolkit to kind of really be well prepared to really start your, your work on this. Oh, thank you very much. Um, could you give us maybe a, an example of how um, the, you can leverage the framework to to, to guide company uh, engagement as an investor? Yeah, yeah, I kind of touched on that a little bit. So we are actually applying the principles and the due diligence framework mentioned in the guide. Plus, I mentioned the, the data. So we have actually built a database um, for each investment team 
with um, bringing in different data sources. So we get the data from, as I mentioned, uh, each data providers company reports, but also uh, through lots of uh, think tanks and NGOs. So if we bring together as much as we can to improve the coverage of, of the data, and then we have that kind of as a kind of a file database for investment team. And then um, we, with that, they can kind of play with the data and already be able to prioritize a few companies. Most cases in our um, investment team, some teams, they could use the filter and then they can come up with like maybe three important companies. Some other teams would come up with like eight uh, priority companies. And then based on that, we actually conducted some case studies. Uh, so we would pick these companies and, and show them exactly how the research and the further due diligence is done using the principles mentioned in the guide. So investor, inv our investment teams, analysts can actually look at it and see, ah, okay, this is how the guide and the, the data um, all come together to really understand, for us to be able to understand the company, what they're disclosing, you know, some of the inconsistencies that, that we see or gaps. Um, so it will all kind of come out and I wanted to kind of show, um, show our, our, our portfolio managers how this can be done. And after that, they have much better understanding of the company's kind of strengths and weaknesses. And because we've done this kind of due diligence, they are in a, when they, before they're going to uh, uh, meeting, meetings with these companies, they know so much about what the company has been doing, you know, and then they also have very concrete, tangible questions that they can ask these companies. So um, some examples, although we're really beginning this uh, process, uh, whenever we approach this way, after going through the steps mentioned in the guide, companies actually learn from us because they didn't get to see this perspective from investors, like what we're looking to see and how we were able to find these, these gaps. So uh, oftentimes, instead of just criticizing, oh, okay, where is this? Do you have the supply chain policy? How are you sourcing the commodities? We actually propose, you know, come up with a much more tangible and practical way, kind of um, also, we can um, compare, um, not compare, but provide some some uh, case studies of other companies in the same sector, maybe as best practices. So all of this, I think, uh, kind of prepares us well and our investment teams well uh, for engagement. And together working, you know, it opens doors uh, for us to work together with the company to find solutions together. So this is how we've been applying this. Thank you very much for uh, these very instructive uh, notions and uh, elements. Uh, thank you very much to both of you, Patrick uh, and Joanne, um, for this uh, this fireside chat. Uh, we have uh, two questions, I think, in uh, in the in the chat. Uh, one is very tricky uh, and going back to uh, uh, the very notion of invasive alien species. Are human beings invasive alien species? Um, actually, it's a, it's a very complicated question, um, but we are native to uh, s some ecosystems. Uh, our capacity to impact them, of course, can um, make me answer yes. Um, but on the other hand, we also have a self-reflective capacity and the, the possibility to reverse our uh, impact uh, on nature over time. So I would say that uh, maybe temporarily, uh, but uh, in the near future, we should be able to um, uh, have a more positive and uh, uh, as Patrick Rowe said, uh, a net gain uh, over biodiversity that would reverse that perception of uh, human human beings being uh, an inv invasive alien species. Uh, the second uh, question goes to uh, Patrick. Uh, um, Somebody is uh, interested about understanding uh, how soil properties may address issues such as uh, highly threatened species um, being sold in TCM outlets uh, in, uh, in some malls. Okay, yeah, thank you for the questions. And um, I guess the tenant engagement side of works is uh, something I haven't touch on and discuss, and uh, it's an important part of our overall strategy. Uh, consider our tenants and our moors, they can be very important stakeholders as you, you know, Gratian in your PowerPoint, you know, PowerPoint most mentioned, you know, sort of f &B, the impact of f &B from some of the studies by BCG is, is one of the highest impact uh, sectors that you have identified. So I guess on on that, I mean, uh, we have a currently we have a program called uh, Green Kitchen Initiative, um, and basically that's this a bespoke program that we develop primarily to address uh, tenants 
all sort of environmental uh, impact to to uh, in their operations and uh, the design of the shop. And it's not only addressing nature and biodiversity, but it's more on a comprehensive framework that addresses climate change, address, address waste, water, and inclu including their um, sort of procurement practices. So when we start to develop, you know, uh, engage a t tenant potential, you know, tenant to rent a space, for example, in a, one of the FMB, you know, outlet in a more, we'll, we'll start engaging all these tenants with that, you know, Green Kitchen initiative, and we provide a sort of technical guideline for the FMB tenants to integrate in their in their design and for example on things on you know uh, how you run a design a energy efficient kitchen also with you know very good uh, exhaust uh, uh, fan ventilation uh, efficiencies and also how we um, uh, design a kitchen with sufficient recycling structure right so these are all important and they have to be introduced at the onset when before the tenant section move in. Once you've done, uh, once you've done that, you ensure your operations will be, you know, will be entirely uh, uh, conducive for for the uh, for the operations to and uh, to meet the sustainability targets. I guess on your question regarding some, uh, you know, endangered species and also uh, some critically critical threatened species. I guess this is an area we are we are still working on. Of course, we have our own sustainable food policy that you know, smart property itself. You know, uh, we don't procure them, uh, including things like shark fin, uh, you know, bluefin tuna and humphead rats, for example. You know, those are important threatened species. But on tenant side, I guess this is uh, still an area that we wish we wish to strengthen the engagement with them. OK, as long as, you know, the species, uh, there is a, a, a concern. Right. So we have to started to integrate that, you know, criteria in our green uh, green kitchen guidelines where we will do actually assessment with, with our tenants. So they uh, they have to meet certain criteria in order to be recognized by Green Kitchen. We have you know three levels, like three leaves, two leaves, and one leaf. Three leaves is the highest standards. So I guess uh, sustainable procurement strategy, food policy is, uh, is actually part of that you know, assessment scheme. So um, you know, if the, if the tenant is able to you know, uh, uh, share with us, they have a you know, uh, well-written, um, procurement policy, you know, that supports sustainable procurement. For example, there are, you know, a lot of works guided by the NGOs. NGOs are, one of them is a, the seafood guy produced by WWF and some other organizations. I guess this is one of the, uh, one of the areas that I think as a landlord can promote more with the tenants when we do business with them, how, how we promote, you know, these sort of resources out there in the market to actually steer and also facilitate the understanding of tenants in terms of procurement efforts. So uh, I, I guess this is an area that we, we have to sh further strengthen uh, the efforts on it and in, ensure that also a way to help the, the tenants to measure their efforts. For example, our, for a realm, we all actually measure our sustainable procurement expenses. And we also set target for, for swipe properties. Um, for example, by 2025, you know, 50% uh, of procurement spend have to be sustainable. And that's, you know, according to your know, own certification scheme and standards. I guess this is also an area that, you know, we can actually encourage our tenants to do. So to, so for overall, we can track the success, track the joint efforts um, to, to help that agenda. So this is an ongoing efforts that we, we hope to do more in, in future. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you so much, um, Gretchen, Joanne and Patrick for the overview of nature and biodiversity.